Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Just and Aaron for inviting me and to Baroness Nietzsche and for hosting us here. Um, it's very terrific to account for. So I'd like to give you an economist's perspective on the affordability crisis, or what many call the cost of living crisis. Economists aren't generally known for uh, their huge skill in providing dinner entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll do what I can. Uh, even though the current state of things isn't terribly good and not terribly palatable. The global economy is facing challenges in its climb out of the COVID crisis, and most of those challenges weren't foreseen. Emerging from COVID shutdowns, inflationary pressures built quickly in the goods sector, where there was, and still is, a mismatch between the demand and care will depend on policy already taken and which might be taken. A lot also depends on labor markets and how that performs, and also on household behavior, on spending and saving. And unfortunately, a lot also depends on things that are very difficult to predict, like Mr. Putin, European decisions regarding gas imports, and OPEC supply decisions. The key problem facing UK households is falling real incomes, induced by high inflation, and pay and benefits that will not keep pace. There are also other squeezes on household finance. So I'll elaborate on each of those in turn, describe the pain overall, and also who will be hit hardest. I'll start the discussion of inflation with a bit of shock and awe. We've probably seen in the news in recent days the vast increases in gas market prices, the sharp rise in oil prices, and its immediate impact on UK petrol prices. On Monday, oil touched $139 a barrel. That's its highest level for 14 years. The average price of petrol uh, rose pretty quickly to £1.56 a litre. That's a rise of around 50% since June last year. And that means that the cost of filling up your tank has risen by 20%, 20 pounds in the last year. This price shock is unfortunately likely to persist for some time. Fuel company executives expect the petrol pump price to rise to £1.70 and your fuel tank filling will cost £100. Futures prices do indicate expectations that petrol prices will come down. They'll return to more normal prices in the middle of the decade before rising again due to uh, climate protecting policies. There's a great deal of uncertainty about this critical energy price, with a lot depending on political decisions inside and outside Russia and on whether other oil supporters boost production. We're all well aware of the existing energy price rises UK consumers face, with the energy price cap rising by £693, or 54% in April. Unfortunately, we've recently seen further large rises in UK gas prices, with the UK market price briefly touching £8 a therm on Monday, or over £500 per barrel of oil equivalent. Average annual dual fuel bills will be £3,000 if the average gas price over the first half of this year is £3.20. And my expectation is that it will exceed that. The government energy bills and council tax rebates will provide an extra £350 that will help with energy bills in 2022, but add £40 to bills over each of the next five years. How important is oil and gas affordability to UK households? Even with the energy bills rebate, the lowest income decile will see their energy bills share of spending rise from 7% in 2019 to 10% in 2022. The council tax rebate will only help those in 
vanity of the and below, which excludes more than one in ten of the bottom 50% of the income distribution. Even with those policies, 20% of households are predicted to be in fuel stress in 2022, which is defined as spending at least 10% of income on energy bills. And that's before any further rise, rise in the energy prices. So what about inflation more generally? Economists now expect inflation to exceed 7%, with a peak of over 8% in autumn as the October rise in the energy price cap kicks in. And with that, uh, another essential, food price inflation is likely to be even higher at around 10%. Of course, lower income households whose consumption is dominated by food and fuel essentials will be unable to make substantial cutbacks on what they purchase. Their household bills will inevitably rise by 10 cents or more. And they are less likely to have savings as a cushion. Surveys confirm that households are noticing and reacting to inflation. A growing proportion, now 81%, of households have been reporting to the Office of National Statistics that their cost of li living has risen. As expected, food, gas, electricity, and fuel were the key drivers. Most were adapting by spending less on non-essentials, and more than a third in reducing energy use at home. Working households, disposable income, will also be hit by the 1.25 percentage point rise in employee and self-employed national insurance in April. However, the impact of this is progressive, with a disposable income of the lowest decile falling by only about half a percent, compared to over 1% for the top half of the income distribution. Incomes will not rise to match inflation. Whether working or on benefits, people will see their incomes fall in real terms. Over the next 12 months, households on benefits will suffer greatly from the lag in benefit uprating. Benefits will be uprated by 3.1% next month, matching CPI inflation in the year to last September. The much higher inflation expected this year implies a real fall in benefits of around 5%. The fact that benefits will be uprated in April 2023 by something like 7% to match this year's inflation, providing a likely real terms rise, will not help make ends meet this year. The Resolution Foundation has estimated that the real cut to benefit income is in, is in the order of £10 billion. Pounds. Wage settlements are not forecast to keep pace with inflation. Employers are raising pay to recruit, but upward pressure from existing workers on their wages remains muted. This is consistent with surveys finding that workers still fear unemployment. The fear of unemployment still remains high, and despite becoming more aware of inflation, expectations are lagging. So price expectations and inflation expectations are still around 4%. In April, the minimum wage will rise by 6.6%, but the expectation when it set that number, the Loan Pay Commission had, that that unusually high rise would represent a real terms increase will not be realized. High inflation and weak nominal pay growth will lead to substantial real pay declines for workers over the next four few years until mid 2024. That's three years of decline. The major falls in real income come this year and next when inflation is at its highest. All this adds up to an overall fall in household disposable income that I expect will be in the region of 3% this year. That's worse than the Bank of England's February projection of a 2% cut, which itself equated to 
uh, £1,000 fall in average real disposable income. The projected real income fall in 2023 is characteristic of a severe recession. It's reminiscent of the fall seen in the financial crisis or the oil crisis of the 1970s and looks longer than the downturn of the early 80s. Furthermore, unfortunately, income risks in the short term are on the downside. How is this pain distributed across households? In 2021-22, economists expect that low income households will fare worse than others due to the real fall in benefits. In 2022-23, it's not good for everyone. There's a 4% fall across the board. In 23-24, the lowest income households are slightly better off than others, largely due to their delayed benefit updating. The greater suffering of lower income households contrasts with their recent experience. For several years, many, although not all, lower income households have been doing slightly better than most in the economy due to minimal wages increasing slightly faster than average earnings. And also, they benefit from prices. The fall in income for less well-off households comes at a time when finances are already tight for many. You undoubtedly already have a good picture of household debt. For example, the step change debt charity, uh, whose head of policy, Peter Tuffin, is obviously here with us tonight, recently estimated that 4 million people were already using credit to pay household bills. Similarly, Credit Ghana estimates that one fifth of households are using credit cards, loans, or overdrafts to pay energy bills. How will policy react? If energy prices remain this high, commentators believe that some financial support from the Treasury will be needed. What about monetary policy? How far will the Bank of England raise interest rates to curb inflation? In the face of inflation that is now stemming from supply shocks, international uncertainty, and where the downside risks to demand are high, I would expect the bank to rein in its interest rate raise plans. Even if these national measures are taken, there will still be an urgent need for more targeted support of those worst hit or who slip through policy nets. On that, on that slightly less happy <laughs> note, <laughs> Ray and I will leave you. But I'm very <coughs> happy to take questions or uh, uh, other comments uh, from uh, members of the audience who I know know a great deal about the uh, uh, scenario on the ground. Spending habits changed because of lockdown and various other measures imposed by government. To what extent has that affected the level of saving in the economy across the different income groups? And therefore, do you say that actually that might provide cushion in the short term? Yes, uh, that, that's a very good point. And I was, I had wondered whether to include it in my speech. Yes, the uh, household saving has risen. Uh, as people spend less. The distribution of that saving, uh, unfortunately, will not be terribly helpful in, uh, in preventing the squeeze on lower household incomes uh, finances. Why? Because it, uh, the, those at the bottom haven't been able to save. Uh, all of their money goes out. It's the people on the higher incomes who saved money by not, not going to restaurants, 
not going to the gym, uh, that sort of, one might call it luxury, was curtailed in the COVID crisis, and they're the people who've saved. So unfortunately, the rise in general saving hasn't helped. Any other questions? Yes, yes down there. Uh, unfortunately, not at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, unless, unless, <clears throat> I would say unless there's huge political pressure, and I, it's not Ofgem's role to do that. Ofgem follows a formula in pricing, and unless there is government instruction to change that formula, mm. it won't change. So, I mean, the, the prospect of £3,000 uh, average bills is a real one. I think it. I think it will happen. I expect that the government, rather than wanting to change that formula, uh, well, I, I'll say something else about that in a minute. Uh, rather than change that formula, we'll want to do something in terms of. I, I'm going to call it fiscal policy, government spending instead. I do think. I do think, though, that there will be thought within government about uh, changing the way the formula is enacted, because it, it's become all too evident that six monthly uh, revision of prices is uh, too inflexible. The problem is that even having a more flexible pricing wouldn't solve our problem. It would just mean that the price, is, the price changes hit more quickly. So that, that's not the solution. Unfortunately, that sort of pricing mechanism is needed in order to, in order to keep energy suppliers in business. Um, um, I don't think Ofgem has got much choice uh, unless there is, uh, for example, government sub huge government subsidies of the electricity market. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm Yes, I guess you talked about you know, government support is needed. I agree. It's hard to see another way. I guess the question is, given on the back of COVID, COVID expenditure, can you say anything about what fiscal headroom government has to actually give the help that's needed? You know, it's a purely political. What constraints do they have? And what what headroom have they got to actually help us? Yes, they do have headroom currently uh, because the um, the government for but you probably know the budget deficit has fallen at the fastest rates for decades actually because the revenue from taxation particularly business taxation the economy's grown slightly faster than predicted and even that slight uh, faster growth has generated a lot more tax revenue than expected so the OBR you know, forecast looks now wrong it looks too uh, pessimistic the government has more money to play with um, I could say more. We have a, the, the Chancellor has made noises that he um, enjoys the fiscal retrenchment that's happening. So he, uh, it does sound like the Treasury is prone to uh, be not be generous in terms of spending. However, things are moving very fast. They are seeing just like everyone else the uh, huge price price rises in the oil and gas market. They know as well as anyone. The, the pain that that's going to cause, and that current measures are not adequate to counter those. So I, 